Hello again. Welcome to chapter two of ecology. Why am I in the same outfit as the video for chapter one? Well, that's because I'm recording this one about two hours later in the same outfit. So let's talk about climate. Now the cover image that's in your book shows this like cloudy forest, but I decided to put in my own picture um, from when I was doing field work during my dissertation research. This is a picture um, of a high elevation hostel that I was staying at while I was doing research in Panama um, and in a cloud forest. Uh, and you can see why it's called a cloud forest here. Um, there's really high amounts of water moisture in the air there. And in the mornings and in the evenings, you get this really thick, beautiful cloud um, in the high elevation areas in Panama. Um, so let's talk about climate and what makes these cloud forests. So first, let's make a, a clear distinction between weather and climate. Weather is a combination of temperature, humidity, precipitation, wind cloudiness, and other atmospheric conditions occurring at a specific place and time. So that's a really important distinction between weather and climate is that specific place and time component of it. So I'll repeat that definition of weather again. So you don't have to rewind. Weather is a combination of temperature, humidity, precipitation, wind cloudiness, and other atmospheric conditions occurring at a specific place and time. So this GIF I have here, this is weather because this is at a specific place and time. Now climate, on the other hand, is long-term average pattern of weather, and it may be local, regional, or global. So it's not, climate is not what's occurring on an individual day, it's what happens over a long-term period of time. Um, and so that's why I've got this GIF of the entire globe looking at temperature patterns that occur over time throughout the year. So that's weather versus climate. Now let's talk about the um, physical aspects of the globe that contribute to climate. First, we need to talk about the greenhouse effect. Now. Um, I'm sure you've all heard of greenhouse gases. There are some that are natural. Um, and the greenhouse effect is the combination of those gases and radiation coming in from the sun to warm the Earth's surface. So we have several different types of radiation that are at play here. We've got incoming shortwave radiation that's coming in and hitting the surface of the sun. Some of that incoming shortwave radiation is then reflected back and so that it goes back out into the atmosphere. You've also got uh, radiation that's being emitted from the Earth that's long wave. Um, some of that is going to make its way out of the Earth's atmosphere up here. Some of that is going to hit the greenhouse gases in the air and reflect downward. And that's long wave, downward long wave radiation. So you've got long wave radiation um, being emitted from the earth and then reflected back from the greenhouse gases and then you have shortwave radiation from the sun um, coming in and then sometimes being um, dissipated back out off of the earth's surface. And so that's the greenhouse effect. Basically it's called that because it works kind of like a greenhouse where light comes in through the glass and then it gets trapped in there and creates a temperature inside the greenhouse. Now greenhouse gases are the atmospheric gases that then make some of that radiation become reflected back down onto the, surf, the surface. Natural greenhouse gases are things like carbon dioxide and water vapor. Um, as I'm sure you all know, especially the environmental science majors, we've now contributed a lot of unnatural greenhouse gases or increased the amount of natural greenhouse gases that are in the air. So we've increased carbon dioxide from emissions. Um, there's also methane and there's other things that we've contributed to the greenhouse gases. Now you can imagine that you increase the amount of gases that are in the atmosphere. You're going to increase the amount of long wave radiation that then gets trapped when it's reflected against those warming the surface of the earth. So 
The net radiation that is on the Earth's surface is a combination of the incoming shortwave radiation minus whatever gets reflected out. And then you've got the emitted minus the downward. And that's the net radiation that's at the surface of the Earth. And all of that, the net radiation, is going to contribute to the surface temperature that you have at the surface of the Earth. Now, if the incoming shortwave radiation is greater than the outgoing longwave radiation, that's going to increase the surface temperature. So if you have more radiation coming in than you have going out, then you're going to increase the temperature surface of the Earth. If you have more outgoing longwave radiation than you have incoming shortwave radiation, so you have more going out than you have coming in, you're going to have a decreased surface temperature at the Earth. And so this is how you get different temperatures at different places. Now, here is a map from your textbook of the net radiation. Um, all of this is measured via satellites. Uh, a lot of data that ecologists use, especially when they're studying uh, ecology at the biosphere level or at the biome level, um, will use uh, atmospheric data that's collected via satellite. So this is a, a map that's been made of the net radiation measured across the globe. Now, hopefully you can see some kind of pattern here where there is a lot of net radiation across the equator and lower net radiation at the poles. Now spend a minute or two and think about why that might be. Do, 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 do. Do, 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 do. Yeah, you can just pause the video. Anyway, the answer is, is that it has to do with the orientation of the Earth in relation to the sun. So at the equator, you've got a shorter distance from the sun that increases the amount of incoming uh, shortwave radiation that is hitting the surface. So you get higher surface temperature and higher net radiation at the equator. Now the poles... This only has one pole on it. The poles have a longer distance away from the sun. And so because they have a longer distance, they've got slightly less um, incoming shortwave radiation. And so they have a lower net radiation over the year. Now net radiation actually changes over time and this is discussed in your book but I thought this gif really illustrates why that changes so you, let's wait until it refreshes over in January so here it is in January you can see the net radiation the high points are moving up the globe into July so you've got high points at the North Pole happening let's wait for it to come back again around June July August starts to move back. So in June, July, you've actually got higher net radiation occurring at the North Pole than you did at the other. So spend a minute and think about why net radiation would change with the months. Do, 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 Okay. <laughs> that changes because the Earth is on a tilt. So, um, this is a really great graphic from your textbook explaining why you have different changes in net radiation with the months because of the tilt of the Earth. It's not perfectly symmetrical all the time. So in, the, in this one, it shows the, the tilt that you have when we have the summer solstice in June. Here's the tilt you have when you have the winter solstice in December. I'm not going to read this all off, but make sure you understand why we have a change and, and can explain on the test why we have a change in where the hot spots of net radiation are over the course of a year, and that is because of the tilt of the Earth and its orientation to the sun along that tilt. Now here we have two graphs that are going to illustrate some processes that we will talk a little bit more in depth and how they affect the ecology of the Earth um, when we get to the end of the semester. Um, but they're important to understand now because they contribute to climate. Um, and that is um, fluctuations in temperatures at the poles compared with along the equator. Now, because of that tilt, if you think about how the Earth spins on its axis, 
the equator is getting much more consistent net radiation from the sun because it's getting direct sunlight most of the time. And that's due to the rotation um, plus the tilt of the Earth. So you can see here at zero degrees, where that's the equator, you've got pretty stable shortwave radiation across the entire year. Now at the poles, as you can see in both of these, there's a 42 degrees change in some of these areas at the poles. Um, and that's because of the tilt. So there are times during the year when um, these areas up here have sunlight 24 seven because of the tilt of the earth. So they are spinning, on, the earth is spinning on its axis like it always does, but because of the tilt of the earth in its rotation around the sun, there are times in the year, actually you can see right here, during June and July, when these areas up at the North Pole have 24 hour sunlight. But then there are periods in the winter here where they have almost no solar ra shortwave radiation coming at all and they have 24 hour darkness. And that's because of the tilt of the Earth and uh, as it spins around the sun. Now, actually, I'm gonna tell you a little bit about my experience doing field work right there in the Arctic Circle. This is a picture I took in the Brooks Range in Alaska when I was doing field work in the Arctic Circle. I took this picture at 10.30 at night. Uh, I was studying bees in these Arctic regions, and actually Graham's going to work on this for his project, or some of the guts I pulled from bees up there. Um, I was there with a team of researchers trying to um, do a, a study of uh, parasite pathogen diversity and bumblebee diversity. Now, you imagine that um, if there's only sunlight in June and July in these areas, flowers can only really bloom in June and July. And you don't got bumblebees if you don't got flowers. So the only time that there are bumblebees out in the Arctic Circle where, this pic where I took this picture is in June and July. Um, they are in hibernation mode underground nine months out of the year. And so we spent... Uh, two and a half weeks up in the Arctic Circle collecting bumblebees. Sleeping here, there's also, uh, not a lot of people live up here. Uh, there's almost no hotels, so we've lived in camp and tents most of the time and trying to sleep when it's 24 hour daylight or maybe you have like maybe 30 minutes of a sunset and then the sun comes back up at 3 a.m. Uh, it's really hard to sleep, but it was still really, really cool to be there. I can talk about that all day, but I won't. So. In summary, we've got net radiation plus the spin and tilt of the axis of the Earth in relation to the sun. All of these things, all the things I just talked about, the tilt of the sun, the rotation of the sun on its axis, the um, movement of the Earth around the sun within a year, and how each part of the globe is exposed to that net radiation is then going to... Um, result in these air masses that form across the earth. So hopefully at some point before you got to me, you learned that um, hot air rises and cold air drops. And because of that dynamic, um, this and because the net radiation that's affecting their surface and the temperature of the air is going to create these air currents that form around the earth. Now I am not going to expect you to know the names of these. I sure don't. That's my general rule. If I don't know it, I don't expect you to know it. But this is a really great illustration of these different um, air masses that are formed by, so they're circular because of the Earth, Earth's rotation, um, and they have different temperatures because of their orientation to the sun throughout the day and throughout the year. Those air currents as they hit the surface of the ocean, they're gonna pick up moisture from the ocean. That moisture is gonna make its way into the air and circulate back down. Now that, the, the interaction between these um, air masses and air fronts and the ocean creates trade winds and movements of the ocean. So the orientation of the sun to the earth and the spinning of the earth on its axis and around the sun all is at play 
in shaping these warm and cold currents that come across the oceans. Um, obviously, they don't follow the air masses exactly because they hit land sometimes, but all of these are then shaped by these air masses. And all of this is going to influence the ecology of the lands that they interact with. Which I think is really cool. Again, I do not expect you to know these trade winds. I sure don't. And it has, the, the movements and the temperatures of these have to do with lots of different factors. But all you really need to know for the exam and for this class is that these trade winds are, in form, are formed by the air masses and air fronts um, that move through the atmosphere. And all of these things, from the tilt of the Earth to the incoming solar radiation to the air masses that form because of that and the, tr and the trade winds and movements of the ocean that form are all going to affect, all work together synergistically to affect the moisture content of the air. Um, and moisture, as you probably hopefully already learned in high school biology and in gen bio, is really important for life. <laughs> So here's a map of mean annual precipitation from 1961 to 1990. And you can see that there are differences in mean annual precipitation um, in different areas of the globe. Now, those are formed, informed partly by um, the movement of the oceanic currents and how much moisture content you have, but also and also by the air masses. Um, these are just some differences in annual precipitation. And because life needs water, you can see you can make maybe some global predictions about what life might be like or local adaptations might be like based on the mean annual precipitation across the globe. So spend a few minutes thinking about what might be here in these areas where there's very little precipitation or um, what might be in these areas with lots of precipitation. Okay, that's enough. What you probably guessed is that these are deserts. Surprise! And what's here in this place with lots of rain? It's a rainforest, or what's left of it. Um. And you can see there's this really interesting pattern where there's like this very interesting um, separation, distinction in precipitation between the eastern U.S. and into Canada and western U.S. And you see very, well, we'll talk about the different ecosystems that are in these different parts of the eastern and western United States and some of the plant and animal communities that live there later on. Now, one interesting um a uh, phenomenon that's shaped by uh, these rising and air, air cool ma rising air mass cools um, is the intercontinental zone. This is a figure from your textbook, and you can see that in this intercontinental zone, um, because of the interactions of these air masses, um, there's really high annual precipitation here. Now. The intertropical convergence zone is the boundary zone separating the northeast trade winds of the northern hemisphere, northern hemisphere, from the southeast trade winds of the southern hemisphere. So that's what you have here at this interaction, the ITCZ. I think I called it intercontinental. It's the intertropical convergence zone. So I'll read that definition again. This is the the intertropical convergence zone is the boundary zone separating the northeast trade winds of the northern hemisphere from the southeast trade winds of the southern hemisphere. And where these two um, trade winds interact, you get really, really high annual precipitation. Um, and that is going to, uh, but it does actually fluctuate a little bit throughout the year. It mostly stays around the equator um, and you can see that it's not a straight line across the earth um, but this whole area is the intertropical convergence zone and that and you can also see in this graph that um, through this area 
that's where the rainforest is. But there's also pieces of the desert. We'll talk a little bit more about this when we talk about ecology at the biosphere level later on in the semester. Now let's talk about another uh, climatic phenomenon that influences ecology. Um, this is a map of the United States, um, and it shows the annual difference between coldest and warmest temperature. So this is the range of degrees in Fahrenheit that you can get in these different areas of the continental U.S. and um, Hawaii and Alaska. Look at this. This is crazy. Now, I just told you what it was like being up here in the Arctic Circle. There are huge fluctuations in temperature. There are times when it's not even habitable by human. There, it's not, you wouldn't even be able to survive out here at some of these temperatures in the winter most of the time. But then during the summer, it can be quite warm. Um, and so in the Alaska, and then also in these northern parts um, of the western United States, you can have huge temperature fluctuations. We actually have quite a good, quite good uh, temperature fluctuations in Pennsylvania. Y'all know probably by now that um, it can get real hot here in the summer and real cold in the winter. Now, why might this be? We've already talked about some factors that would influence um, across certain latitudes, but why would you see really hot zones here um, and then cooling? all the way out here in Florida where it may be hot a lot of the time, but you don't have really, really huge fluctuations in temperature like you do up here in these northern western states. Now that is because of something called continentality. So land areas farther away from the coast or other large bodies of water. So you actually have um, less fluctuations in temperature up here near the Great Lakes um, because of the bodies of water there. These areas that are farther away from the coast or large bodies of water experience greater seasonal variation in temperature than do the coastal areas. That's what you're seeing here. The phenomenon that is displayed in this map is called continentality. Now, why might that be? Think about that for a second. Oh, did you say because moisture from the ocean is creating more stable climates along the coasts? Well, then you would be correct. So if you are in close proximity to the ocean or to a large body of water, you've got more stable um, precipitation and moisture content in the air, which is going to regulate the temperature that's in those areas. So these areas that are up here that have huge temperature fluctuation ranges, at least in the continental US, that is because they're pretty far away from any sort of large body of water. And so they have huge fluctuations in moisture content um, in the air over time, and because of that, they have huge fluctuations in uh, temperature across the year. Now, Alaska borders a lot of water up here, um, but it has less stable temperatures because it's closer to the North Pole. So you're not you do, but you do see a little bit of continenta continentality going on here, where you have slightly lower fluctuations in temperatures, where it meets the ocean. And then Hawaii has stable temperatures because basically they're all there's a lot of surface area that's exposed to moisture content from the ocean, but it's also closer to the equator and so it gets stability in temperature because of that too. So in Hawaii and Alaska you've got a combination of continentality plus um, uh, distance from the equator at play and then here it's mostly the, pat the pattern that you're seeing here. Most of the phenomenon is continentality. Another thing that it can influence climate on a smaller scale is topography. And topography is just um, changes in elevation um, and structural features of the land. This is a topographical map of Pennsylvania. So Oh boy, where are we? We're like around here somewhere. <laughs> I can, I'm new to Pennsylvania, so I still can't remember exactly where Pittsburgh and Latrobe are on here. But we're around here. So actually, it's really interesting um, to for me to live in Pittsburgh and then commute to Latrobe because sometimes the weather is really different in Latrobe than it is in Pittsburgh because Latrobe is part of the Laurel Highlands, which are at slightly higher elevation. Um, than 
um, Pittsburgh. And because of that, there's a very slight differences in the climate that you have in Latrobe than you do in Pencil in uh, Pittsburgh. And so, like my daily commute to campus is actually a great demonstration of how topography can affect climate. Um, here's another picture um, to demonstrate how topography can influence climate. This was one of my field sites that um, I was collecting at when I was doing research in the Sierra Nevada in California. So this is one of my low elevation sites where I set up my mobile lab. Eventually I got that blue pop-up tent I'm using for office hours now. But this is a lower elevation site that was in bloom. Um, I also had field sites up here and these sites didn't bloom or flower until maybe like August or September because they're much higher in elevation. And so they have some of these areas in the Sierra Nevada um, are technically tundra and they have snow almost all year round. It never completely disappears because they're so high in elevation. Now let's talk a little bit about uh, why that is. So another thing that's at play with topography is um, distance and closeness to a body of water or to the ocean. Now what's at I'll, this is a little bit of a demonstration of what's at play um, in the Sierra Nevada mountains as well. So you've got um, prevailing winds and evaporation from the Pacific Ocean occurring here. Um, the Sierra Nevada kind of, if you're not familiar, I should have included a map of California. Um, it runs um, parallel with the coast of uh, California. And because it runs parallel to the coast of California, um, you have really different uh, climatic conditions on the western side of the mountain range than you do on the eastern side. The eastern side um, is closer to the Pacific o Ocean. You get prevailing winds that run up and you get a lot more um, vegetation on this side, uh, on the eastern side of the Sierras than you do on the western side. And so um, if you're looking f to see redwood trees, Yosemite is on this side. Uh, Sequoia National Forest is on the uh, western side. Sorry, yes, Sequoia National Forest is on the western side of the Sierras where they're getting more precipitation, so that's how you can get these really giant trees that grow over here. Um, once you hit the summits that are really high up, this is where I was talking about how they have almost these tundra-like ecosystems at the top of the mountains. Um, these prevailing winds that carry this water vapor um, can't traverse over this mountain as well, and so you get what's called a rain shadow that forms here. So on the eastern side of the Sierra Nevada in California, um, you have a lot more shrub-like land um, and plants that are adapted to uh, lower water availability. It's much more deserty. Um, yeah, on this side is where you drive to Las Vegas through a lot of uh, lowland deserts. Oh, also on this side, um, you have the Central Valley where like 70% of our fruits and vegetables in the United States are grown. Um, and so that's partly because of this evaporation from the Pacific Ocean that gets in there. And now this that's formed where you can have a completely different habitat and vegetation on one side of a mountain compared to the other side, that is called microclimate. Um, so microclimate are very small um, changes. You can even have it on the side of a hill. We actually can see this at St. Vincent because we're up on a little bit of a hill. So you can have, um, just because of the, the orientation of the hill to the sun, you can have a shaded slope. Um, this is what's going on in the Sierra Nevada is the shaded slope. Um, you, you have uh, less sun and so you have sometimes less vegetation. If it's oriented to the sun, you might have more um, vegetation growing on this side, and this is called microclimate. These are very small changes in climate because of um, smaller differences in topography over a landscape. And so that's it for climate. Um, by Sunday, I'll have up the lecture videos for Chapter 3 and Chapter 4. Okay, see y'all soon. Bye-bye.